Welcome to Econ Roots, your podcast on the roots of economic thought. I'm Stefan. And I'm Otto. Let's get on with today's conversation. Hello and welcome to Econ Roots, your con- your podcast on the history of economic thought. And this season we started on our long journey through the all the laureates uh, in the in the Nobel Prize. Um, and in the first episode, first couple of episodes, or the last recent episodes, maybe I should say, um, we we focused on macroeconomics. But now we're changing gears a little bit. We're changing subject. We are going to talk about trade theory. And uh, before we get to the three stars of today's show, we need to mention a guy who never got the prize, but was certainly the servant of one. And maybe had he lived today, he would have gotten it. Probably not, because he worked a little bit different uh, than, than what we do nowadays. But uh, he was definitely probably one of the most important intellectual uh, figures of the past, which is Adam Smith, because Adam Smith is one of the first people to actually explain what trade theory is. So, uh, Arthur, will you take us to school? Well, uh, Adam Smith is often considered the the founding father of economics and the and really in economics perhaps the subject uh, which is the founding father subject uh, the founding subject the founding, is, the uh, founding subject of the founding that, father is, <laughs> <laughs> is trade theory yes uh, and, and why 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 do people why do nations trade yeah. and basically why do people, people trade? trade and um Adam Smith, uh, who tried to explain the wealth of nations, what makes a country rich, uh, for him trade was important because that uh, it can, can uh, trade make uh, can make you, you rich. And, yeah. But how? Exactly. And and the basically Smith has had two two uh, crucial ideas. Uh, one he, he put into his trade. The theory directly, another which has lingered on and uh, but uh, surfaced uh, much later, and we're going to when we're discussing our last uh, laureate uh, today, Paul Krugman. We're going to touch about upon Adam Smith again. But Adam Smith basically tried to explain trade uh, by the idea of uh, absolute advantage. So the idea was that if if you're good at uh, brewing beer and I'm good at making sausages, then instead of me making beers and sausages and you do the same, then uh, one of us makes all the beer and one of us makes all the sausages. The one who's better at it should do it, and then we can trade. Yeah. Um, that that that's quite obvious uh, why that uh, is beneficial to all. Then came uh, along. David Ricardo, mm-hmm. and he made a very uh, surprising uh, discovery, namely that even if uh, you are better at both making beer and sausages, it uh, we could still uh, could still be advantageous to both of us to trade. And mm-hmm. uh, how? Mm-hmm. Well, it it only requires that uh, that we have comparative advantage. So. If you are much better at growing beer uh, than me, and only somewhat better at making sausages, then we could still trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could make sausages, and you could make beer, and mm-hmm. and we could uh, our joint product would be greater than if we did it in uh, in isolation, mm-hmm. and it would be an advantage to you and to me mm-hmm. to to trade. That was quite surprising, um, and. That that sort of uh, produced uh, the, our basic trade theory, um, and then uh, it has been developed over time. It's much less controversial than macroeconomics mm-hmm. have been, um, which we have been been discussing in the previous uh, episodes. But it has been the, the development over time, and I guess this is where our the, our next uh, contributor to trade theory. Actually, was uh, uh, young enough to get the Nobel Prize. Yeah. So, would you introduce him? Yes. Uh, before I do that, just uh, I thank you very much for that introduction. I think, I think it's such an important issue to, to do this because, um, so the idea of trade theory actually also relies on 
on division of labor, right? One of the main insights of Adam Smith as well, which is, you know, like natural if you understand economics, but still somewhat controversial a little bit. Some people don't like it. They they don't like the idea of it, but it is definitely true that I am bad at most things in this world. There's a couple of things I can do, sort of, sort of, right? So so let me do those, right? But also, I think what 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 Smith and Ricardo did, and then later on also modern trade theory did, which is really important, is to explain how trade is not a zero sum game; it's a positive sum exactly. game, right? Uh, which is something that people still struggle a little bit with today. So I totally agree that trade theory is a lot less controversial than uh, than macroeconomic uh, um, discussions, but there's still a lot of stuff here that people are take for granted or don't fully grasp or don't quite like, right? So I oftentimes mean pundits who don't know much about economy will explain the the market as a game, right? Well, it's not a game. It's not ending and it's not it's not a winner takes all, right? This is exactly what Ricardo is doing. Even when a when a poor nation trades with a rich nation, it still benefits, right? Which and that was I mean that must have been so controversial back then. I mean really controversial to to come with that statement. So Without uh, further ado, let's uh, jump into the first one. So that's uh, Bertil Gotthard Olin, who was Swedish, or uh, not an American this time, born on the 23rd of April, 1899, and died on the 3rd of August, 1979. Um, and uh, he... Uh, he um, he was awarded the prize jointly in uh, 1977 with uh, the British economist James Mead, we'll get, which we'll get to later, for their uh, path-breaking uh, contributions to the theory of international trade and international capital movements. And Olin's uh, contributions, which we'll get to, is the Heckscher Olin model. So he was Swedish. Um, he was an academic for, uh, for most of his life, but he was also a politician. He... Um, uh, he was the leader of the People's Party, a social liberal party, which was the largest opposition party to the Social Democrats in Sweden. He was, a, uh, he was involved with that from 1944 to 1976. Uh, sorry, uh, 67, 67, sorry. Um, and he also briefly served as a minister of trade, actually. So he actually got his hands dirty a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, um, and let's just get my... My notes here. He was uh, one of uh, seven siblings born in in rural Sweden, uh, and uh, especially his mother uh, Ingeborg was very influential with left liberal sort of views on him. So, um, um, and way we focused on like Nordic cooperation and these kind of kind of things, right? And and um, um, he went to school at Lund University, where he got his Bachelor of Arts in 1917. And he's got his Master of Science from Stockholm School of Economics in 1919. And then he's got his Master of Arts from Harvard University in 1923. And his doctorate from Stockholm University in 1924. And he actually was a professor at the University of Copenhagen. Yeah, in uh, 1975. Uh, as you listeners know, we're Danish, but we never really had a Danish uh, 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 recipient uh, uh, in the in the prize in economics here. So we have to take what we can get here. So yes. like, you know, we, we're, we're borrowing some glory here. Like anyway, uh, um, interestingly enough, while he was uh, uh, in 1979, he actually had a big debate with uh, with John Maynard Keynes actually, because Keynes famously predicted that the war reparations would uh, would make Germany go to war again, and uh, Olin actually disagreed. He thought Germany was a strong enough economy to to avoid that. So uh, that's a really interesting um, uh, debate in its own right. Um, and uh, he was sort of like part of this whole Stockholm school with Knut Wicksell and, um, uh, and this whole like sort of precursor to uh, to a lot of the economic development we, we see later. And for his many contribution, uh, the city of Stockholm named the street after him. So I don't think many economists has a street named after them. So I think that's pretty good. Yeah. So what can we learn from him, Otto? Really, what he he and and Hexer yeah. looked at was um, why do countries why do countries have advi- uh, uh, advantage uh, or uh, comparative advantages? Why do they have the advantages, comparative advantages they ha- they have? Mm-hmm. Um, so in in Ricardo's example, I made the example of beer and sausages. In Ricardo's example, it was uh, wine and, and cloth, mm-hmm. and um, and he assumed that that England had an uh, advantage in in making cloth cloth. and uh, uh, cloth, cloth and uh, and and Portu- 
girl had an advantage in, in making wine, and then they would train. And uh, there's no disagreement there uh, in, in, in the uh, Olin, Hector Olin model. Uh, but uh, we could go a little bit deeper into that and try to exp explain why that might be. Mm -hmm. And one uh, reason, and this is what is pointed out in their model, is that it, it could depend on the uh, relative scarcities of production factors mm -hmm. in in the two countries. Mm -hmm. um, so if it takes more capital <laughs> to make cloth and it takes uh, more labor, it's more labor intensive to make wine, mm -hmm. then that could be the reason why, mm -hmm. um, why um, Portugal makes wine and then England makes uh, cloth. Right. Uh, so it, it, so the, 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 the the relative scarcity of production factors uh, is, is going to drive uh, the comparative advantages and trade. Mm -hmm. And one interesting uh, 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 implication of the theory is that um, in the outset, before we trade, if if uh, labor is more scarce, then relative to capital, then you should uh, you should uh, expect uh, labor to be relatively better paid mm -hmm. than uh, capital and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So uh, wages would be higher in England than they are in, in Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we open for trade, then uh, if you trade goods between countries, that would tend to equalize the, the wages that are earned by the production factors, mm -hmm. even if the uh, production factors are fixed in the countries. Mm -hmm. So even if, 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 if all the machinery stays in Britain and, and all the labor stand, uh, stays in, in Portugal, they don't emigrate, uh, they, they stay put, yeah. there, there will be a, a, a relative rise in, 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 in wages uh, uh, compared to capital uh, in, in Portugal and, and vice versa in, 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 in Great Britain. So mm -hmm. you see, we economists become integrated, mm -hmm. even if 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 we only trade goods, yeah. not not the production no. factors. Yeah. Like people would be a production exactly. factor. Yeah, and also there's another point to the theory is that um, the precise makeup of like the relation between, for instance, capital and labor is not constant over time. I mean that can change, right? So for instance, so there's, there's a bit of the early onwards towards de developmental economics in this. Like, for instance, China was a low cost production country. That is not necessarily true anymore. And that might then have implications for uh, for how trade will, uh, like global trade will develop over time, yes. right? Which is, I think, is an interesting part of the model as well. Um, cool. Um, um, yeah. So he got the prize with me to go on to meet now. Or? Yes. Yeah, I think so. That's good, right? So uh, James Edward Mead uh, was born on 23rd of June, 1907 and died on the 22nd of December, 1995. He was British, so not American either. And like I said, he got the prize with uh, Olin in, uh, in 1977. Um, so uh, he was born in Dorset. He was educated at Melbourne College and attended Oriel College in Oxford in 1926 uh, to read Greats, which is a humanitarian program of the ancient classics and so on. But he actually switched to philosophy, politics, and economics, the PPE, uh, very famous when an education uh, uh, approaches um, and gain an outstanding first. Very, very well done. Um, and he um, he actually got into economics because he had frequent discussion with uh, many of the leading economists of the time, in, including people like Dennis Robertson and and, and Keynes. Actually, um, he worked for a while uh, in politics. He was in the League of Nations, which was a precursor of the United Nations we have today, and in the cabinet office. Uh, and uh, he was actually also a leading economist in the early years of the of the Clement Attlee government in, in the UK. Uh, and then he took a professorship at London School of Economics, and then later on at University of Cambridge. Um, and uh, he um, 
so to, to sort of yeah, before we get into his uh, his theory, um, two things that are worth noting. He's a he's a really interesting writer. He's quite fun. I like uh, reading his uh, Nobel lecture. It's uh, is it's he's uh, he's very humorous. He's very sweet actually also, and, uh, and he's, he's very fun. Um, I like to read a little bit from not from his lecture, but from his banquet suite, which I think is interesting and says a lot about the time, the seventies, and also what sort of influenced him. So he says that quote. Without some vision of the nature of the good society, the whole activity is pointless, and the immorals of the subjects, immortals, not immorals, immortals of the subjects, <laughs> very important different, Adam Smith, which we mentioned, Mixell, which we mentioned, Keynes, which we mentioned, uh, to name uh, only three of my favorite gods uh, bear witness to this truth. Political economy thus lies somewhere between the vision of the literature and the precisions of natural science. For this very reason, economists are especially liable to engage in wishful thinking, to observe only what supports their own particular brand of moral and political preconceptions. But I beg of you to remember that economists are, after all, human beings and that they are not responsible for the creation of the universe on a plan which exposes them to more, more than others to this particular temptation. The will balanced economist is a moral is a normal human being with his warm heart on the left his practical workaday hand on the right and his clear and thoughtful head in the center <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good it's a good of how he writes he writes very differently from any other economist but it's very good it's a bit hard to read it aloud but uh, but it was uh, it's it's quite good it's a very loaded language you can see his his fascination with the uh, with <laughs> with the ancients and uh, and humanities and so on so uh, i know that he's famous for demonstrating the effects of economic policy on foreign trade theory but but why else why why did he get the prize Otto? well he 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 worked in a in in a lot of fields and he as one can guess from yeah. from his uh, his career was took him uh, a lot of places uh, he got it for, for, for uh, the prize especially for his uh, trade theory, uh, theory yeah. along with with Olin and uh, what um, uh, but he, he did a lot of other stuff yeah. but yeah. but uh, what what he he pointed out uh, in his trade theory was that uh, even if uh, free trade is, uh, is producing a, a better uh, outcome uh, for all, mm -hmm. um, so it's welfare enhancing, yeah. we say, in, in economics, in to, econ to, have, speak. Yeah. to have free trade. Yeah. Um, what happens if you restrict trade in one area? Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, if I, I uh, if, if we, we trade uh, sausages and and beer still, and uh, and I put a, 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 a tax on, on on your beer, um, would free free trade still be at advantageous advantageous uh, for for the rest of of the uh, of the economy? And what meets uh, showed was that that's actually not the case. If you get into the so-called world of second best, mm -hmm. a lot of strange things can happen. Yeah. And one of the strange things is that if you start to to, to regulate in one place, regulate trade in one mm -hmm. place, then it could be advantageous to uh, to do it in another place. Oh no! So so uh, so basically, basically, uh, if uh, if, if uh, it, I, I think, but what is important to take away is mm. that if if you have tree, free trade, you should you should have uh, try to to get it as free as possible. Yeah. Because if you if you just restrict it, uh, then the case of free free trade is is not longer so apparent, and yeah. then you can end up with 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 a lot of uh, restrictions on trade. Yeah. So that's his trade theory. But 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 uh, of course, as you pointed out, he, he did a lot of work mm. in. Uh, in in explaining uh, how the uh, national domestic economy interact with the external uh, yeah. economy, um, and uh, like Mon 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 Mondel yeah. um, uh, later on got the Nobel Prize for for, for pointing out uh, much more extensively yeah, yeah. Than, than me did. Um, <laughs> I think it's also interesting to remember this was a prize in 77 and before you get the prize you you know it takes some time and all that um not so much back then as now but still and 77 is you know it's a period it's the 70s it's the 
you know, it's the dark 70s and there's lots of nationalized industry and there's union interests and all these kind of things. And in many ways, it was one of the least globalized periods in modern history. I mean, we were more globalized in the 1910s sure. than they were in the 1970s, right? So, so this idea about how if, uh, how persuasive free trade has to be in order to get the most benefit is extremely important bene- insights for the benefit of humankind, right? And and that was, you know, originally the intention of, of the Nobel Prize is to benefit humankind. So it's, it cannot be stressed enough. It's very important, especially when you think back to the times where he made these thoughts, right? Because they would not have been popular at that point. It's like every politician wanted to protect local industries and national industries and every, right? All this kind of, and we had, I mean, yeah, well, let's not get into that too much, but <laughs> I think we all knew the uh, the the, um, the negative welfare effects of that. So um, definitely a well-deserved prize as well. Um, should we say more about him? There's not that much more to he say. Was, uh, well, Who so? He had a, yeah. had a commission named after him, the Meat Commission. The Meat Commission, all right, please explain. Which uh, gave the British tax system uh, an overhaul. Oh, uh, nice. So, uh, the dream of every economist to be allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, Not just the British tax system, but ex- just the tax system in general. Ex- exactly. <laughs> and uh, actually, they, they they took up the idea and uh, quite recently, yeah. which is, I think, 10 years ago yeah. or, or something like that, they had the Mealis you know, uh, yeah. Commission, which was basically... Uh, modeled on the on the meat commission, the meat commission. giving the the the, 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 the British uh, tax system another overhaul yeah. uh, and putting another famous tax economist uh, yeah. Mealis, uh in 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 front of the work. So yeah. um, so uh, meat was doing a lot of uh, yeah. different things. It's not just uh, high theory, not just trade. But I think again, also the history of the price back then was, I mean. It was more limited, right? And uh, I, I think it was very well deserved prize for this contribution alone. It was very a very thoughtful prize of the committee to actually think about that and 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 honor that in a time where where that was not necessarily what most people would prefer. You are listening to Econ Roots, your podcast on the history of economic thought. Thank you for joining the conversation. So the last staff today is uh, Paul uh, Rubin Krugman, and um, uh, we have decided. To, so Krugman is today <laughs> probably more known as a pundit, and I use that as a no- neutral term. Uh, like he's saying a lot of stuff. He has regular columns and so on. We are mainly focusing on what he got the prize for. So uh, just uh, uh, just to to say that up front. Um, so. Uh, Paul, Paul Rubin Krugman um, was born on February 28th in uh, 1953. He's an American, so now we're back to the Americans. Um, uh, and um, like today, people would say, as I, I mentioned, he's an economist and a public intellectual, so pundit or commentator or whatever. He's also very open about his his opinionated journalism work and so on, but it has nothing to do with why he got the prize. <laughs> so it's very important. He got the prize in 2008 uh, for his contribution to new new trade theory, which we'll explain in a moment, and new economic geography, which we'll also explain in a moment, two very important contributions and very well-deserved. Um, and um, uh, basically, it's about understanding how the patterns of international trade uh, relates to the geographic distribution of economic activity, right? So... Uh, and explaining how this interlaces with economies of scale, consumer preferences for diverse goods and services and so on. But we'll get to that in a moment. He was born from Jewish immigrant pa- uh, parents from Belarus and Ukraine, as far as I remember. Um, and he has his reason for becoming an economist is actually science fiction. So he uh, he uh, he was a big fan of science fiction generally, and especially Isaac Asimov's uh, foundation novels which is a novel where social planners uh, fix the ills of society in the future. Interesting. Yeah. Yes, exactly, very interesting. And and the, the theory to use for that is something called psychohistory. And since that did, wasn't invented, Krugman decided that econ, econ, uh, econ, uh, economics was probably the second best to that. So, uh, so that was why he got it. Uh, there is an interesting relation between science fiction and economics, but that's a whole other podcast series. But anyway, um, so... Um, um, I think there's a prize in scientific, I think the Hugo Award, I think it's called, is giving for like libertarian sci-fi or something like that. So uh, there's a whole whole area there. Um, 
Anyway, he's uh, he's right now at the City University of New York. Um, uh, but before that, he has uh, been at MIT and he has been at Princeton. He's been at London School of Economics. He started at Yale. He actually also worked for the Wigan administration briefly. I don't think many people know that today, but he did. Um, he's the author of 27 books, ranging from scholarly works to textbooks and for more like generally audience things, and over 200 published articles. And I don't know how many... Uh, um, so uh, I don't know how many uh, hundreds of of columns on like in in, in issues like I'll New York Times, sense. Fortune, <laughs> Slate, yeah, exactly all that stuff, right? Um, and his prize motivation was for uh, or the prize motivation for his analysis of trade patterns and locations of economic activity. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, I was reading through his banquet speech and I was sort of like laughing because uh, um, it reads sort of like a LinkedIn post. Some of it, <laughs> like, like at one point he said, he's explaining how he thinks it's a practical joke. This is where we comment for some of the laureates that they don't believe they really got the prize and so on. But he's explaining how he got it. And then he says, then he says like, eventually, however, the awesome reality uh, sank in. And what I felt was not pride, but a sense of astonished humility. And this sort of sounds like somebody who's accepting an internship at Deloitte or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Krugman, if you hear this, <laughs> I know you were you were first move on this. You 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 didn't know how people would uh, <laughs> would take that up later on, but anyway, uh, uh, for his trade theory, I think it's a well deserved prize. So let's start with new trade theory. Should we explain what that's about? Yes, um, I promised we would get from we had Adam Smith. We had, we had some, we started yeah. out with Adam Smith. Yeah, he we'll had an idea Smith. which is which was sort of uh, neglected for a long time. It's just been. Uh, become fashionable again mm -hmm. and the basic idea that Smith has had was that you could have uh, increasing returns to scale mm -hmm. um, usually we, we think of uh, of uh, decreasing in, yeah. uh, returns to scale if I plant grain mm -hmm. on a field uh, it'll I'll give me some new grain. If I plant double that uh, amount of grain, I won't get double mm -hmm. uh, amount of, of, no. uh, of grain because of uh, decreasing returns that's to scale. scale. So, and that's very often what we see, especially from an individual point of view. Yeah, well, from um, a point of view, for instance, yeah. yeah so, yeah. so if, if if I work uh, eight hours a day. I couldn't double my output by working 16. No, no. Uh, so that's what we often see and very often assume. But uh, but we don't always have uh, decreasing, but could have increasing returns to scale. Mm -hmm. um, and we could have it because of what you mentioned, uh, the division of labor. Yeah. So the division of labor could drive uh, uh, the scales to increase. I mean, basically, if you, if 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 uh, if you plow a field, <laughs> and, uh, and you can you, you can uh, you can employ a tractor, mm -hmm. you you can plow much more than than you could before, um, and that mm -hmm. has to do with 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 increasing returns to scale from from. Being being more people, and what happens when we when we introduce that into um, into trade th uh, theory? Um, that was really what what uh, what Krugman st uh, stumbled over. Mm -hmm. So um, so increasing return to scale is one idea. Yeah. And but what we might see if we only had increasing return to scale was that. Um, you would have an extreme specialization among nations. Mm -hmm. So one nation would produce all the tractors, one nation would produce all the beers and so on. Because if, if, if we're yeah. increasing returns to scale, then then um, then then that what is what you should expect. But um, what uh, uh, Krugman also employed was an idea, especially it was uh, uh, developed uh, by by Dixit and Stieglitz. I'm talk, we're going to talk about uh, Stieglitz later on. The idea that variety is a good in itself. Mm. So, so um, consumers 
will prefer uh, a choice of a, a variety of things. So you don't eat the same thing for dinner every night. Yeah. <laughs> you like a variety of things. Yeah. So, and uh, the idea of having a variety and uh, on the one hand, mm -hmm. the love of our variety on the one hand and uh, increasing return to scale. Really, and uh, this is what Fruitman showed in a very simple article, could explain a lot of uh, trade going on, which which you should, wouldn't expect yeah. from our standard uh, yeah. theory. For instance, we talked about sausages. Yeah. Um, in Denmark, we produce a lot of sausages, but so we export sausages, but we also import sausages. <laughs> so this is quite strange. <laughs> Why does this intra-industry uh, uh, trade uh, happen? And it happens to to a large extent, um, an increasing extent, that that you buy things from abroad or and export things that that uh, you also produce in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in 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 your own country, and. The idea, the interaction between between uh, increasing returns to scale and the love of variety, can really drive this uh, this this new economy. And uh, what has it got to do with geography? Well, it. Oh, before we get to that. Yes. Um, so what you're also saying here is that technology is really important for how trade manifests, right? Yes. That's where important yes. point of yes, that's that. What, that. What, Often will drive will drive the the uh, uh, increasing returns. Yeah, exactly, scale. exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's just so our listeners understand. Yeah, yeah. So what does that have to do with new economic geography or just geography in general? Yes. Well, have you noticed something strange? Um, that the if you look where people live, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in Denmark, we don't spread. Uh, out all over the map. Oh, we tend to so, uh, group together. Why don't why why do we move together? Uh, actually, if you want to buy a piece of land, uh, it's much more expensive to buy it where there are a lot of other people mm -hmm. uh, uh, who are in your way, and making a lot of congestion, <laughs> yeah. uh, than it is to to buy it the, out in the countryside for yourself, yeah. and that can be explained well increasing returns to scale as well mm -hmm. so so a city basically is some uh, an area where we exploit the increasing returns to scale so other people might get in your way they might make uh, congestion they might compete with the attention of um, uh, goods and services mm -hmm. uh, um, and other people uh, but they'll all th also, a lot of uh, good things about oh, yeah. having uh, people uh, close by. You can work together. Mm. You can exploit uh, the division of labor. Um, so, so that um, so increasing return to scale until some limit. Limit, yeah, of course, uh, is 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 the reason why um, um, why we have the geography we have, yeah. and uh, so there is an interaction between geography and trade. Yeah, and and Krugman was was uh, one of the first to realize that. Yeah, I think this is uh, really interesting. It's it's it might sound sort of banal now that it's explained, but it, as you said. It, it wasn't incorporated in economic theory. There was a curriculum here that, that people see. The curriculum, sorry, there was a conundrum here that people uh, didn't didn't understand. They couldn't explain. Um, but it is actually like it is. It is a very logical thought, right? Like I live in very central Copenhagen. So do you? We live in Frederiksberg. Um, we can buy stuff twenty four seven. We can like walk to a grocery store, like all that kind of stuff. But we don't have to go that far outside of Copenhagen before. If you want to buy groceries, you have to plan it because you have to like drive somewhere, and it's only open for a certain amount. But because there are that many people. There's more trade. Quite simply, there's simply more trade, right? Exactly. Which in itself is a benefit. It's a good in itself. Right? Trade in itself becomes a good with this theory, which I think is a really interesting and, and, and important takeaway as well, right? Trade in itself has has merits, right? Yeah. Yes. And of course, what a, a lot of what we have seen with globalization uh, is uh, can be explained with the addition to tr trade theory yeah. that uh, Paul Krugman made. It yeah. can also be explained by by the Hexiolene uh, to some extent. Yeah. The, we see uh, is the, the 
wages are rising, especially in low wage countries yeah. like uh, India and China, and China, and, yeah. uh, and and so that has to do with the with with with, with the uh, equalization of of, the, of of wages uh, as explained by 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 Olin. but um, the. The modern trade, where you tr- trade the basically same trade the same goods, yeah. <laughs> um, or it's it, or what appears to be the same goods, yeah. uh, uh, has to be explained by um, by by this 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 new theory um, put forward by 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 Krugman. Yeah, and should we mention the, yeah. uh, that uh, he was very young when he made oh, this? Yeah. Basically, two articles. Yeah. Uh, Made when he was the first one was I think he was in his middle twenties. Mm. The second was in when he was in his late twenties. Um, so so he did a, a lot of important work very early on. That yeah, maybe why he <laughs> got time to to engage now in the, in a lot of polemics. Yeah. Um, yeah, we should talk a little bit about diplomacy as well. We'll we'll leave that until we're done with it because I think that is a very important point that he did this very young and he actually goes into quite a lot of detail when he reads like his interviews and biographies about this because when he wanted to tackle trade theory, most people thought he was dumb. Like it's like why care about that? Right, it's settled. And then he sat down. He started working on this, and um, apparently, as at least that's how he remembers, he said, "Like after three hours of work, I realized this would be defining of my entire career," which is like really cool. It's a cool story. Like <laughs> it's like you take this topic that everybody thinks is settled. There's no more to do here. It's just you know, and then you actually g- give a crack at it, and you you do you know what science do best is asking interesting questions, and then you know you realize there was actually a whole area here that could be expanded. Um, so in that way, he's also an an, an interesting scholar. Um, I mean, he is controversial. I mean, we have to mention that, right? Like, just like Friedman was controversial for being on on the right, Krugman is not controversial for his economic contributions that he got the prize for. Those are not no. controversial at all, not at all, right? But because he did go on to be more like an opinionated journalist and so on, and and many lay people have a hard time understanding that you don't get the Nobel Prize for just being like smart in everything, right? Like, you know, <laughs> which was what Hayek, you know, was afraid of, right? He, I mean, he got it for some very specific, but he talks about all sorts of other stuff, right? And and especially Americans on the right can have a it's sort of like a red flag for them at times, right? Uh, and it's sort of like when you read him in Denmark, I mean, he's... I think we would probably consider him not that left wing. We probably consider like center left, the uh, establishment type guy, right? In many ways, like he was very critical of Bernie Sanders, for instance, and so on. Like you know, I mean, we can definitely come up with a lot more left wing people here. That's, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but but it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting issue that like you can get the prize for something you did when you were young, and then of course that prize sticks with you your entire life, which gives you authority even when you speak on subjects that are might not related to that, right? And I think this is why he's, he's sort of a red flag for some people. I think that would be fair to say, right? Yes, but it, as you said, it has uh, nothing to do with his, his, his price. And he he does comment on, on economic subjects yeah. very often, uh, macroeconomics. Uh, I think that uh, when he... That's not his area of expertise, no. and it's not very sophisticated no. when 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 he does, uh, and and very often you you can't really see how is this, what is this based on? Yeah, what exactly. is the theory behind this? Yeah, and and well, uh, you don't necessarily need that if you're writing an op-ed column in no. the New York, New York Times or you're bashing some. The president you don't like. Uh, <laughs> he did that a lot with one of them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, he was especially <laughs> George Bush. Exactly. Was, yeah, he spent uh, a lot of time uh, bashing him. Yeah. But, but I think he has been partaking in a lot of. Uh, yeah. I mean, I also think that this, from an economist's point of view, and it is also sort of weird to discuss somebody who's very much still alive. <laughs> but so you know, again, uh, uh, this is just us second guessing. But in a way, like. He comes out of an MIT tradition where, you know, you model stuff, right? The model is important and then you you stay on the model, but that's important. Not necessarily theory per se, right? So this, this is another way. And the and the modeling approach of the MIT school, in quote unquote school, is, you know, a simple model that explains the main things, right? 
uh, which when done correctly is very beautiful and, and very scientific, but of course is, is a hard thing to do. It's not, I mean, and, um, um, and, and it doesn't leave a lot of room for like theory for theory's own sake, for instance, right? So there's a lot of stuff that, that, you know, if you're more theoretically inclined economist, might you know be annoying, especially when he goes into fields that are not quite his expertise, mm. right? I think that's also part of it. Anyway, uh, but there can be no doubt that it was deserved for the third theory he got, and it, I think we should start to run out this episode now. Um, trade is extremely important, and trade is sort of like the price mechanism, which the price mechanism Harvard, fa- uh, sorry Hayek, famously called a marvel, right? Because it was it was something that worked. But people didn't just took it for granted. And it's sort of the same with trade, right? It's sort of the same, right? People take it so much for granted that even within like the field that you care most about it, economists, uh, there's often a lot of uh, there, there's 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 a lot of people that necessarily understand how important it is right. and and how it works. So I think this is why this is such an important topic. It's sort of like the in, yeah. It it's a theory about why the world is not zero sum. Exactly. So uh, why there is an advantage to both or all parties taking part in trade. And yeah. that's very often that is runs against the our basic intuitions yeah. intuitions. If I of course if if, if we have a, a very limited world, we have given a given number of goods, uh, then if you consume one good, I can consume it. Yeah. So that's the that, very often, how we, we we tend to think, yeah, and it it it, it could be right in the very short term, yeah. uh, but but the idea is that you can, when you have trade, you can make everybody better off, yeah, and uh, actually, even if we have uh, a, a given number of goods, if you start out with a given number of goods, you could end up uh, with. Uh, Everybody being better off simply by trading. Yeah, exactly. And and lots of experiments have shown that so, uh, when we do that. And, yeah. And I think that what is um, often overlooked, even by economists, is that trade theory in a discipline is about the relationship between countries. Yeah. So it's an advantage for one country to trade with another. But basically, uh, all the conclusions hold for individuals as well yeah so um so so we can both be better off by trading one another um so trade trade theory is 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 really true for individuals as well yeah i agree and this is actually a good point in one of our earlier episode i think it was episode four we talked about micro foundations and the debate with micro, to what degree micro should match the micro foundations of microeconomics and trade actually is is very well aligned like it, whether you're talking about a nation or a person, it's built on basically the same theory, specialization of labor. We can see the same effects and so on, right? We get, I trade my time so I get money, which is more efficient than me going out and like whatever, hunting or something like that to get my food, right? Um, so I think that is a, a, a very important thing and it's a very human thing, which is also important to remember. So uh, Bud Wilson, who's a really, really cool uh, modern economist, he works a lot with Werner Smith, who, who got the Nobel Prize. Um, he recently wrote a book that I will recommend to listeners called The Property Species. And one of the points of that book is saying that one of the things that makes us human is the fact that we trade. Right, I mean, certain monkeys and so on can, or apes or whatever it's called, can have property. They can have an understanding of property, yeah. like this is my stick or whatever, right? But they can't trade it. They don't understand that you can trade property, right? And and the idea that there are like rights associated with things, right, which can be different from the thing itself. And this is something that seems to be maybe even genetic to humans because we've been doing it since the Stone Age. We know people traded. They went as far as maybe a hundred kilometers to trade, which would been which is the same as going to Mars on foot today or something like that. <laughs> Go Actually, right yeah. Adam Smith believed that we had a, a propensity yeah. to barter and trade, as yeah. he called it. And um, uh, yes, uh, some uh, body uh, it has been pointed out that Neanderthals yeah. weren't uh, – Perhaps uh, they they weren't inferior intellectually to. Oh no, they had bigger brains. I think. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. but but the one thing they didn't have uh, was the propensity to That's barter right. and trade, and, yeah. and that uh, creates uh, what uh, you could call 
the a collective brain. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. can actually use, but we're not. We're having the division of labor and of knowledge, yeah. uh, and that's facilitated by trade. Yeah. It's possible, made possible by trade. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't have to know how to make beer. Yeah. If I don't, really, I don't. You know, uh, have to know how to make sausages, yeah. and then I can turn sausages into everything I need. I can buy beer from you. I can buy. Uh, Uh, bread uh, and so on by a very complex web of trades. Um, yeah. But basically, this is this, maybe this is the core of humanity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I <laughs> mean, that's that we are uh, able to we're able to speak and we're yeah. able to to cooperate uh, by by trading. Yeah, that is a that's a very good. Hayek, I think, points it out as well. But he says that you know one of the probably one of the reasons why language developed was sort of like so we could facilitate trade, right? That's this is what we needed to do, and uh, I think it's so interesting. Like, I have a video on YouTube that I'll link to in the show notes. It's in Danish, but there's English subtitles where I go over a case uh, for 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 thirty thousand years ago in Denmark, where due to a volcanic eruption, trade was cut off, and that made society poorer. Like we said, we we degenerated, right? Because we couldn't trade with other things because we couldn't get the stuff we needed. We couldn't get the technology. We forgot how to make composite yeah. bows and these kind of things, right? That's interesting. Yeah, that's really that's interesting. Really interesting. Um, and another example that I also really like is like the whole Silk Road, right? I, I read somewhere that it took like two years to do that journey, right? I mean, imagine going away for two years from your family. Why would you do that unless you had that potential to trade? And going like again. We could not even begin to comprehend how foreign and weird traveling the Silk Road would have been at the age of Marco Polo, right? Like it's a, it, like different worlds and and all these these kind of stuff. But but we still did it, right? Because we had the potential to trade. We understand that this can make the world richer for us. This is what we need to do to make the world yes. better. Um, so, and in, interestingly, when I when I was uh, when when I was in high school many years ago, uh, the one one of the Greatest fears uh, of the time yeah. uh, was uh, overpopulation. <laughs> the idea <laughs> that that we would uh, create more and more congestion for one another. Yeah. Uh, basically, yeah. this is what overpopulation is: that yeah. there's too too many people, too 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 few resources. Yeah. But what has happened is that uh, population, the population, as it has grown, yeah. and consistently over time. Uh, we have become richer, yeah. not uh, only collectively, but individually. Actually, if you look at it, uh, I try to run the numbers uh, as far back as I could find, uh, which is uh, a very long time, uh, thousands of years. Every time you double the number of people, you quadruple the uh, the the production. Wow, that is so, that is so so so. So the returns to scale yeah. is two yeah. uh, in in human beings, yeah. and it still is to the same. Yeah. And um, just to round this off now, because I think we we have to go out for beer and sausages. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and just to uh, listeners, what, one of the reasons why this also works is, is you know because even if I even if I am making I don't was I making beer or was I making the sausage yeah. I was yes. making the beer all right so even if I made beer I mean there there is for my individual there's a falling return to scale right because one I can't drink any more beer right and the same thing with sausages but when we start to trade we see this transition which is uh, what what the lawyers today have have pointed out that now there can actually be an increasing returns to scale because we trade right yeah, exactly. so we solve the problem of our atomized human cells by actually here going in what you call the big brain or the big web or whatever. And this is so cool. It's almost magical. Most people don't understand it because they and it, because they don't think about it. But today we had three people who actually thought about it and that was really important. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you also for joining today as well. Thank you. And uh, until next time, listeners, stay rational. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us exploring the history of economic thought. You are welcome to email comments and suggestions to stefan at cpas.dk. Please like and share and recommend this podcast anywhere you can and think it's relevant. Until next time, stay rational. Yeah.